Hello, my name is Opal Singleton. I am the president and CEO of Million Kids. Please follow us on social media to stay up to date on the latest cases and the latest announcements. This is a Million Kids Insider Alert. In this particular case, it's a case analysis. So it's gonna be a little longer than some of the others. But if you're interested in being educated on how large scale gang sex trafficking rings operate, this is your deal because stay tuned, we're going to analyze this particular case. It's out of Texas. The main player in this case is a male, 39 years old. His name is Tremont Blakemore. He went by the gang moniker Magnificent and uh, often went by Mac for short. He was indicted November of 2018. Now this is three years ago that he was actually indicted. And so you say, where, where's it been since then? Well, the case is just now coming around and uh, gonna go to its final trial. He was charged with aggravated promotion of prostitution, engaging in organized criminal activity, money laundering of more than $300,000, tampering with evidence and compelling prostitution by force, threat or fraud. This case was put together by the Homeland Security Investigations as well as the North Texas Trafficking Task Force. They conducted this uh, investigation. Homeland Security also has a uh, a department called ICAC, Internet Crimes Against Children, and they are my heroes. This is an excellent case to understand how a gang trafficking, sex trafficking ring works. So led by Tremont, known as Magnificent, there were two other females in this case that were also charged. Donna Gonzalez and Peaches Hurtado. You may be surprised that the women in these cases are charged, but these, case, these women are what we call a bottom girl. Actually, it's called something else out on the street, but I don't talk like that. But these are girls who participated as pimps. Uh, they participated in laundering the money and recruiting the girls and placing the ads and often disciplining the girls. So yes, they will also pay a price. Now, having done a lot of research on this case, I'm going to tell you that there were a lot more pimps involved. And I think ultimately you'll see more arrests related to this case across the U.S. But we'll go with what we know and what is reported at this time. So it's an organized crime. It's multi-state sex trafficking ring. He allegedly controlled and manipulated hundreds of women. They, they've actually nailed it down to giving names to 20, but everyone involved in the case that's done the investigation believes there are more males involved and also hundreds of women that were exploited. They were sold in uh, states outside of Texas, including California, New York, Louisiana, Massachusetts, North and South Carolina, Florida, Missouri, Tennessee, Maine, Wyoming, and Montana. Those are the ones we know about. I share that with you because a lot of times law enforcement will get a case where you'll have a couple of victims and a pimp, and you're tempted to just stop right there. But so many of these cases, especially if it's related to gangs, are large scale and multinational and there are many players involved. So I'm going to share with you that I researched this extensively, but I took a lot of the data from the Star Telegram out of Texas, a reporter there by the name of Nicole Manna. Now I don't know Nicole at all, but I do want to compliment her. It is very difficult to get the old fashioned research investigative reporting that is coming out of this particular case. So congratulations to Nicole for getting us facts and laying them out for us. She apparently obtained 86 pages of arrest affidavits, which included information from anonymous tips, text messages, social media accounts, and bank records. So I wanted to share with you a minute. Oftentimes what will happen is you'll get a lead, as you'll see in this case, leads came in, a, a task force will get a lead. 
And then they use what they call a crime analyst to do all that background work, see how many text messages they can find, how many social media posts are out there, where did the money go, and track that money to see how big this ring is. So in this case, this indicated that Mr. Blakemore, um, magnificent, allegedly ran residential brothels in upscale Fort Worth neighborhoods. Now that's one of the reasons I wanted to share this case with you because in this business, we often think we're working at the edge of town at the no-tell motel. Well, we do that also and street trafficking where they're working the blade and uh, you know having sex in cars. But many of these rings can often take place in residences and in very high quality neighborhoods, as was the case in this case. I share that with you because when I train people and me and kids trains people, we like to train neighborhood watch. We like to train churches. We like to train the public. And this is why we're doing this today to be on the lookout in your residence. Because in this case, they had rented very upscale houses and it was neighbors who saw this and reported it. So keep an eye out. If you have a rental property in your community, know it and know the landlord and know who they're renting to. And if you're seeing unusual activity, report it to the police. That's what we should do, especially if it's been vacant a bit and all of a sudden somebody shows up and starts having a lot of activity, but no moving vans. Uh, call 911 immediately and just tell them, you know, I think there's something very unusual going on. Would you be willing to investigate? In this case, the people rented the, these upscale houses. And on top of it, it came out, according to the documentation, that Blakemore was a registered member of the Bloods. Now, there's no indication that this is a whole Bloods uh, kind of operation, but I wouldn't be surprised because of the fact that there was a lot more um, activity that took place in multiple states outside of Mr. Magnificent himself. So the case started when a woman told police she was traded to a pimp in Wyoming. Uh, she said that 39-year-old Tremont Blakemore, magnificent, led a sex trafficking ring that had its headquarters in an affluent neighborhood in North Fort Worth, Texas. I want you to stop and think about that a minute because what you've just heard is just revolting. It's just nauseating, quite frankly. She is a woman who has been caught up in the life. Who knows, maybe she started with a boyfriend or being on a dating site and she had some young, good looking kind of guy who began to pimp her out. But many of these women are traded. And I really want you to understand just how brutal that can be. I often will hear from people who say, you know, why would a beautiful 14, 15 year old girl be with that nasty 44 year old pimp? Well, she didn't start out that way. She started probably in a dating site or with a boyfriend about her age or maybe a little bit older. And then all of a sudden she gets beaten, she gets put down, she gets degraded and she gets traded. And that is what happened here. She started out in Wyoming and they traded her off to Magnificent. Now this is taking place in this upscale home in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, they had rented it uh, and they were operating out of these upscale homes. At one point, the police were called to a house across from the Dallas National Golf Corps. And in this case, it was a six bedroom house on Marcel Avenue in Oak Cliff across from the Dallas National Golf Club. It touted it as the biggest house on the block, according to the real estate ads. On the morning of April 4th, Dallas police cars rushed to the house because they had a report of a home invasion shooting. A girl had been shot in the buttocks after a masked man got inside, and the girl was later taken to the hospital. Officers thought there might be prostitution taking place in the house, but all the women denied it that were being trafficked. And so they're adults and there isn't anything more the officers can do, they left. The next day, a woman at the house lied to Blakemore. This is risky, okay? She had to know that she could never come back when she took that leap of faith. But she lied to Magnificent and uh, told him she was sick. She took an Uber to a Dallas hospital 
And when she was there in the safety of the hospital, she told police that Blakemore beat her and threatened to kill her and the other women he controlled. There were about 20 of them total, she said. And she said she had become part of the circle after a pimp in Wyoming traded her. She said the woman lied to the officers the day before because Mac would kill them if they addressed it. So I want you to think about this. Put the brakes on this investigation a minute and think about what's just happened. The day before there was an incident, police come out, they look around, they're suspicious, and they must have done something to convey their, uh, the trust that, that this young lady felt like that she could take that risk to get out of that house and talk with police and that they could get her assistance and get her into safety and get her away from the pimp and the house and everything that was there. So congratulations to this task force that you were able to convey that message and build that trust. I also want to congratulate the hospital that was involved because obviously there was hospital staff where she felt safe and that she could tell about what was happening and they knew how to process this so that this lady, now that she had taken the risk, the risk of losing her life or being severely beaten if she's ever caught at this to get out and she did. According to the Fort Worth Star Telegram, five months later, what happened is a Dallas SWAT vehicle all of a sudden showed up at this particular residence in Oak Cliff in Dallas. Now, this is not just any house. This is in the very best part of town. In fact, the neighborhood calls itself a luxurious community with miles of beautiful trails to dancing pools at a community center. Sounds like someplace you'd really want to live. The neighborhood is filled with big homes and manicured lawns. Neighbors of the Yellowwood Drive house say it was the only rental on the street. So again, I caution you, if you are in a community and you want to keep your community safe, know your community. And if there's a rental property, know the landlord and know who they're being rented to so that you can keep your community safe. As a uh, Mr. Uh, Magnificent was sitting on the curb handcuffed. Uh, neighbors took his picture and posted them on private Facebook messaging groups. I want you to hear this. Blake Moore's two children, both of them toddlers, have since been placed in foster care. Do you get what I'm saying here? You have toddlers living in a brothel, living in a place where it's controlled by a pimp and some bottom girls, and these kids are living in that environment. I share that with you because I want you to understand that pimps will often get these girls pregnant. They do that to control the girls for the rest of their life. And on top of it, think about the power of this. When your pimp is your baby's daddy, you want a daddy for your baby, but this one is exploiting you in the worst ways. And that is what was going on in this house. Well, according to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, his social media seemed to be used as a networking tool and a platform to show off his wealth. That is often the case. You'll often see a, a, a signs of power and wealth and rap music and women, and they love to brag. So keep an eye out there. If you see an Instagram, if you see a Facebook, if you see a messenger ad, if you see a TikTok video, and you believe that they are promoting uh, pimping or promoting prostitution, then report that. It, turn that in to your Lyris task force or your vice squad so that it can be reported. This guy was a regular hero on this social media. He had men saying, I'm a white boy in this game and I like to learn from the best. So keep up the positive posts because he's saying he's learning to be a pimp from this guy. In fact, what is really heartbreaking to me is after his arrest, some people actually posted support for him on his Facebook and Instagram pages saying he would never abuse women. Well, that's like uh, sex buyers telling me, well, the girl is there because she wants to be. There are women who are out there because they want to be. And there are men out there because they want to be. But all too often, my experience is it goes south in a hurry. 
that suddenly instead of being an independent provider on their own terms, some smooth talking guy will come along to him and say, hey, you're not charging enough. You're too beautiful. You need better social media. I'll be your manager. That's a fancy word for pimp. OK, in this case. And this is how it often starts. So keep an eye out for that kind of thing. Well, SWAT comes in. It's later. It's five months later. And I want to address that. So many of you, you'll give us a, a lead on something and you go, well, it's been a month. Where are they? Well, five months, if you're a victim of sex trafficking, is an eternity. But this is a huge case to take down. They have to go undercover. They have to get enough for a search warrant. And in this case, they, they're starting to pull the threads and find out this ring covers many different states. And they have to find out who else is involved because obviously Mr. Magnificent isn't the only one that is doing this. So in this thing, the operation takedown started to happen. Came after a three month multi-jurisdiction investigation headed by the Dallas Police Department in the end, Mr. Blakemore was arrested and 15 women ages 19 to 54 were given resources for victims of sex trafficking. And also the two toddlers were taking, uh, taken out of that environment. So the investigation ended around September 11th when they did the SWAT team kind of thing where they came in and showed up at this very fancy house in this very fancy neighborhood. Now, I want you to hear the next words carefully, especially if you're an advocate for human trafficking and you want to do everything you can to help victims. There is nothing wrong with that. I admire that. I'm like that myself. But you got to be smart and you have to be wise. These guys are gang members. They're Bloods gang members and they play for keeps. And that includes the women that are participating, not the not the victims I'm talking about. I'm talking about the bottom girls that are the women. Be careful on this kind of thing. The SWAT team vehicle pushed down the open front door. Uh, they he pushed the front door open and they used their PA system to call out anyone inside the five bedroom house. So big house that they're trying to take down. An unspecified number of adults and children came out of the house. Nobody has any clue how many people are in there. Police thought there was an additional man inside the home who was refusing to leave. So to draw him out and wake up everyone else who might be inside this, they used two flashbangs, bangs, one in the backyard and one in the entryway. When no one else exited the house, they sent in a robot. Again, no other occupants were found. They found a Smith & Wesson pistol lying on the floor in the entryway that led to the garage. They didn't say what else they found. Officer also cleared several vehicles that were in the driveway. They broke windows and some because the tent was too dark to see if anyone was hiding and they had a bunch of fancy cars. Why am I taking the time to share this with you? Because be careful. If you think someone's being trafficked, report it. Do not get involved yourself. These guys play for keeps. They're gang members. They're carrying weapons. If they're willing to, to threaten to kill and seriously violate these women, they won't have any problem doing that to an outsider that's trying to interfere. So be smart about it. Take notes, get information, protect yourself, and report it to the police. This is all about money making, power, and money laundering, okay? Every night he gave each girl a thousand dollar quota before they were even allowed to even come home. All they got was $10 a day for food, according to what the girl said. The dates, uh, as the document shows, the women range for $100 for a half hour to $250 an hour, depending on whether the client traveled to the woman or the woman traveled to them meaning a woman might have sex with 10 people in one night in order to make her quota. I want to bring this out because what they're talking about is in calls and out calls. Now they held these houses where people came to them. But as we read on in the investigation, many of these women went on out calls, 
That is the most dangerous kind of uh, commercial sex that you can do. Think about it. If they're coming into the home, there are other people there. They can call for help. The guy doesn't want to pay if he pulls a gun or a knife on them or rapes them or wants them to do something despicable and vile, which they often do. But when you go out into somebody else's facility, you don't know what you're going to encounter. Handcuffs, cages, guns, drugs, you don't know what's going to happen. Now, pimps don't mind because they don't really care what the woman has to go through to make the money. You can charge more for an out call. However, it is very, very dangerous for uh, women in commercial sex. On April 7th, the detectives got another tip about Blakemore from an anonymous source. So what had happened is police found 1,700, almost 1,800 online ads for sex related to his operation. They look at the bank accounts and uh, it was Peaches Hurtado that was doing the money laundering. And they're showing all kinds of cash deposits several times a day. If you're looking at money laundering businesses, that is one thing to look at. If you have a lot of cash and you're doing multiple times in, in a short period of time, you really have to question what kind of business are you doing or is this a money laundering operation? And that is why Peaches Hurtado was separate uh, sentenced separately is because she was doing the money laundering. The woman who reported Blakemore to police said the women never got to keep their nightly earnings. I want you to think about this in a big way, especially if you're talking to young girls. They will get caught up in uh, amateur pornography, thinking they're going to be a porn star, star and be discovered. And they're going to make all of this money in pornography. And then they're going to retire really early. I've heard the drill so many times. Or, or maybe, you know, somebody says to them, hey, partner with me. It's a boyfriend. You know, you can make $1,000 a night. You will. But what did these girls get? $10. $10 after a full day of being violated. And even then, they couldn't come home until they had earned $1,000. So I want you to think about the math. Now, they believe there were hundreds of victims. But these 20 girls were each responsible for earning $1,000 a night. That is $20,000 a night that pimp is making just on the girls that are accounted for, or else they're not allowed to come home. If you multiply that by 365 days in a year, that means that this pimp, just with the 20 girls we knew about, was making over $7 million. Okay, he had some overhead in the house rental and like that, but not a lot. This is about money laundering. If he really had 100 girls, just think how much money this is taking place in this operation. So what happened here is that in Flower Mound Police Department, they were reported to have a brothel there. They said that the department had started getting complaints more than a year ago that there were a lot of women at that house, which was being rented and neighbors were suspicious. And so I'm proud of this neighborhood because they were paying attention and they're reporting. Now, when the police went out there, there were several women. We separated them. We talked to them individually. And they all individually said, no, nah, we're just a bunch of women living together. There's no sex trafficking. There's no narcotics. And they vehemently denied anything was going on of illegal nature. So there wasn't a whole lot police could do. They're adults. They couldn't prove it. And like that, all of them denied it. But it was important that those neighbors reported that because they have the files. They have a history of how long this had been going on. So I'm looking at the uh, Cross Timbers Gazette here to get this. When I research these cases, I try to get information from everywhere and validate that it in fact is factual information. So they had all these complaints, but they couldn't do anything about it. So what happened, excuse me, the, the police uh, said they kept an eye on the house. They didn't ignore it. They even interviewed the homeowners association and the owner of the house. Because think about this, if the owner of the house knows this is going on, there are participants in it and they also can be at risk and of being charged. The pressure seemed to have prompted them to move out of town about seven months ago. So the police were just kind of like a dripping pipe, just going on and on, pounding away at this. What do you think? Could this be prostitution? And the heat got on them. 
Uh, so they said that they could not find any offenses being made in uh, Flower Mound. They were trying. It wasn't a brothel, but rather people were receiving uh, phone calls and then going out to those out calls that I talked about earlier. According to the Star-Telegram report, the larger investigation started in April when the woman was shot in the behind that we'd already talked about. And the woman finally the next day snuck out and went to the police. So when, what I want you to see is the power of that. You know, they have been quietly investigating based on all these leads, but couldn't prove a thing. But they stayed with it and they had over 60 pages of investigative notes about that case. So when one of those women finally decided to trust the police and get out and get into the hospital and then get into the police, they were able to bring the investigation together in a powerful way because they had already been accumulating this information. So they were, the police were able to identify up to 20 victims of sex trafficking, females, 19 to 54, all uh, being posted online and needing to make $1,000 a night. As they began to investigate this, at least seven of the victims have been identified and interviewed by the investigators. They found out that this had been going on as early as 2011, okay? And even as recently as when they arrested him in 2018. So that's seven years. If he's making $7 million a year times seven years, that's $50 million right there that had been going on that they were finally able to bring this to closure and do an arrest. Blake Moore, the victim said, required absolute loyalty from the women. He, he trafficked them. He encouraged them to get tattoos bearing the magnificent name. This is called branding, okay? He kept them apart. He didn't let them form close friendships where they might be able to rebel together. And they couldn't talk to other men unless the man was a commercial sex uh, customer. Now, every now and then somebody will ask me if they're, they're on a jury and they're saying, hey, this woman's alone in a motel room. Why doesn't she tell? Well, first of all, sex buyers are not Boy Scouts. And second of all, she could lose her life if that customer tells the John. All of these girls were branded with his name, Magnificent. And so I share that with you because I have sex buyers who tell me, well, I think the girl's there on her own. I don't think she has a pimp and, and she'll have a crown this big with a name Magnificent on it. So look for some tattoos that are like roses that are made out of dollar bills, uh, maybe a, a diamond with lights on it and the pimp's name on it. Um, maybe you'll have cream, cash rules, everything around me. In this case, she's branded with a pimp's name. Now, the seven women who spoke to the investigators said that he had used physical violence to coerce the OBS. He hit them with objects and burned them with cigarettes. That is very common. Watch for strangulation marks. Watch for ligature marks on the arms and the wrists. Watch for hot iron burns or cigarette burns or bruises, cuts. Uh, watch the damage on the knees and the feet. Those are all often signs that a girl is being trafficked. One woman said he threw her against an air conditioning unit after she said she wanted to leave the group. When she couldn't stand up, he started to kick her. The woman told investigators she escaped to the front desk of a hotel, called police and drove herself to the hospital. She said she believed he was trying to make an example of her by attacking her in front of other people. This is why we train hotel clerks and hotel employees. Blake Moore also forced the women to have sex with him and threatened them if they tried to leave. Every night he gave them a thousand dollar quota. So as the dates range from a hundred to half uh, hour to 250, they meant that each woman had to have a quota, which meant that she was going to have sex at least 10 times a night. And this is based on 1,789 sex ads. Let's say that there are five dates off of each ad. That's pretty, pretty low. But right there, you have almost 7,000 uh, dates right there off that ad. Now, the victims were rescued. They were brought in and they were given victim services, uh, services to meet their needs. 
This is a very intense kind of thing. And I thank all of you who support local safe houses. We have several right here in Riverside and San Bernardino. The first thing they need is legal representation because he's going to say she's an adult. She did this of her own. She's out there committing prostitution. She even has a record for being uh, uh, arrested for prostitution. And on top of it, she is uh, representing herself against organized crime. So she's going to need legal representation. She needs safe haven. Oftentimes that means being removed from the area. These guys will track you down and they will come after you. They don't want to lose their money income and they don't want to go to prison. And so safe haven is absolutely critical. Psychological counseling, not just immediate, but long term. And this has to be informed trauma style care because many of these girls have PTSD. Some of these girls have been doing this six, seven, eight years. They're used to cowering. They're used to being burned. They're used to being sodomized and raped and, and uh, cut and burned and guns put to their head. They need to be able to work through that. They need medical care. They need rehabilitation, and I'm talking long-term rehabilitation. You cannot just take somebody in for 15 days and think that everything is going to be over. This is a life-changing experience. They need financial stability. They need family services, especially if they have children, and especially if their children have been removed from them or their pimp is their daddy's baby. They need those kinds of services. And they need family support. They need inclusion. They need our acceptance. You know, I believe that the most common way that they keep these girls in the life is tell them they are damaged goods. And I think the fear of damaged goods is probably the greatest fear of all mankind. Every one of us have it. But when you've been through what they've been through, and remember, their photos have been taken. They've been blasted out around the world over and over and over, and they'll never be able to get those photos down. And so they have a challenge going for them that they need long-term inclusion. Now, one of the gals uh, that was a bottom girl was just sentenced. So I wanted to include that in there. Her name is Desiree Lujan. She was uh, part of the alleged trafficking organization. She admitted that she added one of the victims. This is what she'd tell the victim on social media. She called her a snitch. She called her a rat. Uh, she threatened the victim with physical harm, warned the victim that she would post law enforcement reports about the victim online and reached out to known pimps to reveal the victim's identity and police cooperation. So she's threatening literally this girl's life. And uh, when I work with law enforcement, and I am post certified to train first responders, including law enforcement, when we do that, we want the law enforcement to understand that most likely these women are victims, except for when they're not. And that is a bottom girl, a girl who gets promoted. She becomes a pimp. She disciplines the girl. She often can be more violent than pimp themselves. And that is what is happening in this case. Desiree Lujan received a 34-month federal prison sentence. She admitted she intentionally harassed the victim in order to try and prevent her from testifying, and she was sentenced to 34 months. I hope this has been helpful. It's uh, long, it's intense, it's involved, but I want you to understand just how this takes place. We sometimes get a Pollyanna point of view here about sex trafficking, especially these large gang style trafficking rings. They're horrendous and they're dangerous. These people play for keeps. They carry weapons, they are violent, and there is nothing they won't do to keep from going to prison. And especially if they think that they can interrupt by intimidation and keep these young girls in there. So I hope it's been helpful. Uh, I hope that you will go to me and kids and sign up for Insiders Alert. We're just sending them out to our audiences at this point. But in the near future, we probably will take it right back to where it's subscription only. There is no charge. We don't sell your name, but it is a way to get continual updates. And in this case, a long ca uh, case analysis. If you know anyone that's uh, being trafficked, uh, whether it's labor or sex trafficking, whether it's uh, social media exploitation, child pornography, uh, maybe sextortion, being blackmailed, 
Call the National Center for Missing Exploited National Hotline. You can even report anonymously. One of the things I hope you get out of this story is several people reported earlier. They saw something in a house. They saw behavior in a girl. They saw things that made them suspicious and they reported and police investigated, but they didn't have enough for the full case. But when that girl got brave and got out of there and went to the police, they were ready with a lot of supporting evidence from people just like yourself that went to the national hotline and reported some sort of information. That number is 1-888-3737-888. Please follow me and kids on Facebook and on Instagram. I hope that you will consider supporting our work, uh, supporting us in your prayers and supporting us financially. If you're old fashioned and you want to send a check, just go to millionkids.org. You'll get that PO box in there. You can donate by simply clicking the donate button if you have a credit card or you can even text in and donate. We can't do this work without you. This is a longer training, but I hope it's been helpful. So if you want to reach me, believe me, I am not 911. If it's urgent, you call 911. But if you have something you want to share or talk to me about, you can reach me at opaletmillionkids.org. I have a very busy schedule, so I am hard to reach, but I will get back to you. This is how you reach me. Thank you for following us on this Insider Alert, and I'll see you next time on A Million Kids Insider Alert.